My name is Sandy Troutwine, and I'm the director of Species 360 Conservation Science Alliance, or the CSA. Glad you are here today to join us for this special event. I am joined by team members Josh, Gabrielle, Reke, and Morgan from the Species 360 team, and we are delighted to host today's event. Our inspiration for this symposium lies in Species 360's mission, which is to foster international collaboration in the collection and sharing of data to serve global species management and conservation goals. This year, Species 360 is celebrating its 50th year anniversary. Therefore, we would like to thank our members that are recording their data in ZIMS, resulting in a database of species information for more than 10 million individuals, representing more than 20,000 animal species, and with data going back to the mid 1800s. Our new botanical platform, Hortis, is similar to ZIMS, but designed to record plant species. So now there are even more opportunities for data collection and sharing. Today's event highlights the ZIMS database, a comprehensive untapped resource for research to improve the fundamental knowledge of species. It also enables zoological institutions to make science-based management decisions improve the care and welfare of their animals, and provide key parameters to define accurate conservation plans. Today's event is intended to highlight the value of using ZIMS data in modern research and share a few projects to inspire new research ideas. Six international researchers were chosen to participate in today's inaugural event. These projects were selected in an anonymous competitive process and represent fundamental and applied research applications using ZIMS data. We thank all the researchers who submitted abstracts and we encourage the audience to consider presenting at next year's symposium. Today's event is also designed to demonstrate how utilizing ex situ data in research reinforces the recent statement by the IUCN Species Survival Commission on the critical role of botanic gardens, aquariums, and zoos in species conservation. It also supports the one plan approach by leveraging data about plants and animals under human care and applying it to the future of species conservation efforts, which we will learn more about today. This brings us back to Species 360 and an introduction to the Conservation Science Alliance, or the CSA. The Conservation Science Alliance was formed to facilitate international data sharing to inform decision-making, policy, and progress by bringing experts together to advance species research and conservation in the zoological conservation and academic communities. And if you'd like to learn more about the CSA, please click on this QR code. In order to fulfill our CSA vision, our conservation science team works closely with experts from various fields, such as zoological institutions, universities, conservation organizations, and NGOs to collaborate on research projects. We facilitate expert workshops to exchange information, create global partnerships, and aid in developing resources and tools that benefit our community. We co apply a collaborative approach to accelerate our progress towards our shared research goals. We encourage the use of ZIMS and Hortus data to facilitate data science in support of three focus areas species management, species conservation, and policy decisions. The conservation science team at Species 360 manages the operations of the CSA. Those operations include managing Species 360's research request process, 
which provides a pathway to ZIMS data and an access to the and access through a robust approval process that ensures the responsible use of member contributed data in SIMS. Reke Oglen Nielsen, Species 360's research assistant, will share more about the research request process in just a few moments. Our team also facilitates CSA collaborative research projects using SIMS and other data resources to produce scientific outputs such as research articles that benefit our community. We aim to expand our team to produce even more community resources, such as today's CSA Research Symposium. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Morgan Tidier, Species 360's science team lead to provide some examples of the peer reviewed publications, reports, and other resources the CSA produces to benefit the zoological conservation and research communities. Morgan? Hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to highlight that thanks to the collaboration between in, uh, within the CSA and thanks to the quantity and the quality of data accumulated in ZIMS, we have, for example, have been able to publish last year a study highlighting the significant improvement of the welfare at population level for four marine mammal species living in zoological institutions across the last decades. These results have been uh, used by the French Association of Zone Aquarium to influence a law on the potential ban in France on cetaceans, as well as by the Oceanographic of Valencia in Spain for the same purpose. Following this uh, previous study, we had started a huge collaboration with uh, Canadian Zoo and mainly led by Toronto Zoo um, to e uh, extend this method to other taxa that are also under um, question for banning or not in some countries, such as in the in the Canada. Um, and thanks to, thanks to this collaboration, we have been able to publish a graphical abstract highlighting the result, how the population welfare of these uh, two taxa, so great apes and pantheras improved across time in zoological institutions, as well as um, reports uh, summarizing as well the, the results obtained, but also all the knowledge of experts we gather during expert workshops. And we are currently working on providing manuscripts for peer review publications. Yeah, hello. And to ensure that we keep progressing and increasing our impact and to get more professional involved in this process and to, um, to start more research, we recently updated the complete research request process to make sure that the process is more clear, transparent, and faster to process for everyone involved. Um, so we have four different steps that we will go through for this process. The first one will be an internal review in which we will see if we can actually fulfill the request from a technical and data-wise perspective. Then the request will go to a review from our scientific committee and they will recommend the output for the Board of Trustees. When the requests have gone to the Board of Trustees and have been accepted, we will start the data creation and data extraction. And within three to six months from applying from the data, you should be able to receive it and start your analysis. Terrific. Thank you, Morgan and Reke. That concludes the introductory portion of our program today. We'd like to acknowledge our CSA sponsors. It is their support that allows us to develop resources such as today's Species 360's Conservation Science Alliance Research Symposium. If you are interested in becoming a CSA sponsor, please contact me at the email listed here. So on to today's program. We are delighted to share a diversity of ZIMS research projects presented by the international experts behind these projects. 
We hope that you'll find the selection of fundamental and applied research projects interesting, and we hope to inspire you to consider new research ideas at your own institutions. Each speaker will have 10 minutes to present, followed by five minutes for questions. If you would like to ask the researchers a question, please post them in the Q&A box, not the chat box. We will not be monitoring the chat box for questions, so please be sure to add them to the Q&A box, which will be monitored. Team members Morgan and Reke will present the questions to the researchers after each presentation. Um, but we'll, we'll begin with uh, Dr. Megan Brown. Um, so Dr. Brown uh, is the Director of Population Management Strategy at the Association of Zoos and Aquariums based in the United States, where she supports AZA's cooperatively managed animal programs and works to strategically increase the sustainability of animal populations through research and assisting facilities in institutional collection planning. Megan has a master's degree and a PhD in animal and avian sciences from the University of Maryland and completed graduate and postdoctoral fellowships focused on multidisciplinary approaches to improving animal care and reproduction in species ex situ. The title of her presentation is Using the Past to Inform the Present and Predict the Future utilizing ZIMS data to understand changes in collections over time. Dr. Brown, the floor is yours. So welcome everybody and thank you for joining this morning, um, this afternoon or this evening, wherever you happen to be. Jumping in, the project that I'm presenting today is an effort to study uh, collection planning in zoos and aquariums using ZIMS data in step with changes in zoos and aquariums over time, such as changes in philosophy or exhibit trends in an effort to better understand how we got to today. Understanding which broad factors in the past were impactful towards collection plannings uh, might help us predict what kinds of factors might be influential in the future and may inform where we should be placing resources going forward. There are very few published studies on how species diversity has or hasn't changed over time in zoo and aquarium collections, and most of that has been published either as single institution case studies or as anecdotal opinion on the changes in species diversity. So our overall hypothesis for this project is that species diversity and the number of individual animals housed in zoo and aquarium collections within AZA have collectively both decreased over time. We know that there are future uh, deeper hypotheses that we would like to test, such as if the naturalistic exhibit revolution, which started in the mid 1980s, has influenced the number of species, since the naturalistic exhibits are typically much longer, much larger, and so there's less room for fewer animals, uh, for fewer exhibits. Um, or has there been an increase in regulation that has made the movement of animals more difficult, particularly the movement or imports of animals from other zoological regions around the globe? And thus, has this influenced which species are exhibited and the sustainability of these populations? So to test these hypotheses, we've used the multi-facility inventory report within ZIMS, to pull annual holdings information for all AZA member facilities, which report their data to ZIMS, which is about roughly 75% of our members. We've pulled these individual annual reports from 1970 to 2020, so over a 50 year span, across the, all AZA facilities and within specific taxonomic orders. One note, the AZA facility filter pulls all currently accredited AZA facilities member facilities and so does not account for any time that an individual institution may not have been accredited by our um, by our association. Um, we have then taken each of these individual annual reports, combined all of them into one data set within a taxon, cleaned up some of the taxonomy or scientific name inconsistencies, and create a combined full data set for each of these taxonomic groups. 
Um, from this, we are able to compare species holding data over time within similar species. Today, I'm reporting some initial findings from these six mammalian orders represented here on the screen. We have not performed any statistical analysis at this time, and so everything I'm presenting or describing today are simple visual observations from trends in the time series data. So no final conclusions are being reported today. Um, first, we wanna share an overall picture. This is the number of animals and the number of species in these combined, as a combined total for the six mammalian orders we're discussing today. From this initial observation, we think that possibly our hypothesis may be supported as we can definitely see a steep decline in terms of species diversity, which has occurred in the last 20 years. This is the gray bar. Um, and uh, truthfully, we've lost 83 individual species completely within these six mammalian groups um, throughout AZA collections. So the 83 species are no longer represented. Um, through this same time, we observe on the coral colored graph, a decrease in the number of individual animals from about 29,000 to 25,000. This may indicate at least some effort in having more sustainable populations for fewer species, possibly a shift to focus on greater welfare for the species that are known to thrive in human care, or possibly a shift towards reliance on cooperative breeding strategies, such as the AZA Species Survival Plan programs. Certainly, we observe this overall trend here, but it is likely that this does not hold when we start digging deeper to an individual species level. Um, when we look at each order separately, we do see some different dynamics. Note the graph on the left is the number of species over time, while the graph on the right is the number of different individual animals. In both of these graphs, the color represents the same order um, as seen at the top and on the um, axes labels on the sides. Um, we also know that there are two different scale bars in each graph with carnivora, primates, and artiodactyla on the left axes versus parasodactyla, xenarthra, and diprotodontia on the right axes. These different scales are needed due to the difference um, in both species diversity, so the number of species within these groups, and the larger populations represented within carnivora, primate, and artiodactyla. Um, some of the initial impressions we observe, when you look at the red lines, where we see a decline in the number of carnivora species, the species diversity, but an increase in the number of individual animals. We think this is likely because some carnivora species, such as lions, tigers, painted dogs, or pandas, have come to dominate and are often serve as flagship species in the zoogeographic trend. Carnivora also um, holds the marine mammals, otters, and so a lot of kind of the more aquatic species that are able to cross between zoo and aquarium populations, so are able to fill niches for more facility types. Thus, with the carnivora data, we have some evidence for the hypothesis of fewer species, but larger, more sustainable populations. In the purple line representing artiodactyla, we see a rise, but then a, a subsequent fall in species diversity around the year 2000. This coincides with about a 10 year or roughly an ungulate generation after artiodactyla imports into the US became nearly impossible due to mad cow regulations. The individual animal number decline appears concurrently around that same time, but again, isn't as steep as there are likely some popular champions that bolster the number of animals such as giraffe or the species that are able to live, um, cohabitate and live in the extremely popular mixed species open savanna exhibits. Um, so now I'm going to dig deeper into a few of the individual orders. Um, first is an arthra which is in this case very interesting and honestly surprised us. So they've more or less uh, maintained similar species diversity over time, but the number of animals has exploded in AZA. Um, why could this be the case for species that are generally either nocturnal, spend a significant amount of time um, underground or an overall not very active? We think the answer is their popularity as program animals or animals that interact closely with um, humans. 
Um, and popularity in pop culture has made had a major influence on the popularity of sloths. Zoos have been able to harness this public interest to create ambassador programs to teach about the species while still building more sustainable populations. In this graph, I've pulled out the seven species that are currently AZA special survival plans within Xenarthra. Um, the legend lists them from largest population to smallest. Um, here we see a consistent rise in the number of individuals in all species. Um, but even with this rise in popularity, most of these populations are dependent on imports from outside of AZA, and that represented this population growth. And the number of captive births cannot keep up with the demand, as evidenced in the respective AZA breeding and transfer plans. So many of these populations are now working on strategies that allow the animals to participate both as ambassadors and as active breeders to try to support and balance both priorities. Um, next, looking at primates, um, we see a massive decline in the primate species diversity um, and a great decrease in the number of individual primates really starting in the mid 1980s until today. And this we see is a decline of about 2000 individual animals. If we pull out the graphs individually, I have ape represented on the left, prosimian represented on the right. Within the apes, you can see that all of the species are increasing or at least holding stable. Um, I've graphed all of the gibbon species except Siming together, given their um, typical exhibit trends. Um, so you see this, the gibbon line, the green line might be slightly different if we looked at the species individually. But ultimately, we can see that the gorilla, the dominance of gorillas and chimps in this um, graph is um, helping primate numbers to hold strong. I won't go into the persimmons, even though it's a really interesting graph because I am now over my time. Um, but great, interesting trends in all types of primates um, that we will dig deeper on into the future. Um, but so this presentation today was just a very brief overview and an, an initial ob observations on a much larger project. Um, as we continue to add more species, we'll be able to test further hypotheses between these different taxonomic groups, different specific niches, exhibit trends, husbandry needs, and regulatory landscape. But none of this would have been done or possible without the data provided by zoos and aquariums and the database curated by Species 360. The collaborative nature of this data provided by each individual silly gives us a very strong picture of the zoo and aquarium community as a whole and the depth and magnitude of this data that we are able to access through Zims and Species 360 is truly unique and does not exist anywhere else. Um, we are especially thankful for the opportunity to present our preliminary findings today and look forward to additional opportunities in the future. I've included my contact information here on the screen if anybody is interested in reaching out with questions or comments. So with that, I will stop sharing. Thank you, Megan. Wonderful presentation. Ricke and Morgan, do we have questions for Megan? We do. And the first one is if you can re-explain the 83 species that have been lost. So the first part you explained. Yes, so um, those 83 species are species that just are not kept in zoo and aquarium collections anymore. Um, so um, honestly, I don't know that I could come up with an example off the top of my head at this moment, but they're just not found in collections anymore. They have been phased out for a variety of different reasons based on the taxa. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then we have another question saying, according to your graph, the decline of primates could be complete in 10 to 50 years. Is it possible to stop the disappearance of primates? And is there a societal demand that there should be no primates in zoos? I think there are some strong emotional opinions about ha housing primates in zoos. I'm not going to go into that in depth today. Um, but I do think that the number of primate species we're seeing such a steep decline because they were a popular, like a primate house was the exhibit trend. And so there were a lot of 
individually housed or pairs of lots of different species, kind of more of the collecting mentality rather than sustainable populations. So I do believe that as we go forward, that decline will level out and we will maintain kind of a normal um, across the association level of species for primates. Thank you. The next one is, it may be beyond the scope of this study, but have you considered the endangerment status of the species that are either being removed from the collection or that remain in the collection? So it might refer back to the 83 species. Yes, um, and so that is definitely something we're going to co be considering in the data set and in our statistical modeling in the future. Um, both endangered status, um, with IUCN and the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Endangered Species Act status. Um, so, because those affect regulatory and um, desires to have the species within um, zoo and aquarium collections. So I think that is a very important variable to include. Definitely. And then, do you think, based on what you have learned and the increase in research around animal welfare and animals under human care, um, and as well the additional amount of enrichment needed to maintain high welfare will lead to certain species being phased out in zoological institutions over time? Um, yeah, so I believe, I feel, um, and I think the research shows that we're already seeing that. Um, we know that there are some species that do not thrive in human care, despite our best efforts. Um, and so those are, it's kind of a, the the moral and the ethical dilemma of including a species within your collection, um, being able to give them the highest quality care um, and understanding that despite your best efforts, they might not thrive. Um, and so recognizing that um, I think has already led to certain species um, no longer remaining in zoo and aquarium collections. And then someone asking, where can we follow your research? Uh, well, I am on ResearchGate, so you could find me there um, and through the um, Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So we post regular updates with on our association website. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for that fascinating look at the history of how zoological changes, uh, collections have changed over time. So next we have Dr. Joy Tripovich. Dr. Tripovich was able to join us from Australia, so thank you. She, uh, Dr. Joy is a behavioral ecologist working in the Conservation Behavior Lab at the Tarango Conservation Society Australia. Joy completed her PhD from the University of Sydney and science degree from the University of New South Wales. She has over two decades of behavioral ecology research experience working with a broad array of species from both the marine and terrestrial environments. Joy has a special interest in animal communication and how animals adapt to their natural environment under anthropogenic environmental change. Since 2018, Joy has been leading the Regent Honey Eater Conservation Breeding Program and has worked closely with policymakers and advocacy groups to help translate science into decision making. The title of her presentation is An Adaptive Management Approach for the Regent Honey Eater Conservation Breeding Program. Joy, the floor is yours. Okay, so let me paint a picture and imagine this, if you will. It is the 1900s and you're in a woodland forest off the east coast of Australia. The bush is full of eucalyptus trees in blossom and there is even a faint smell of eucalyptus in the air. The forest is buzzing with life and energy and you look up to the sky and you see these immense flocks of these beautiful Australian songbirds zipping in groups from tree to tree, feeding on nectar. Males are singing to females, trying to impress them with their melodic tunes in hopes of pairing and breeding with them. Life is busy here and you take this all in. Flash forward to today and half of those trees you once saw have now been removed. There is now a quietness in the air the region honey eater is now nowhere to be seen. It is now on the edge of extinction with less than 300 adults remaining in the wild. 
Habitat loss has pushed the remaining birds into little pockets across their once vast ranges. Latest research shows that this species is on a rapid trajectory towards extinction unless we urgently enhance our conservation efforts. Today, I'd like to share with you our developments and challenges that we face in the conservation breeding program, helping the critically endangered Regent honey eater. So the recovery program for this species commenced in the mid 1990s with a collection of nine nestlings from the wild. And since then, the program has released successfully um, 400 birds to New South Wales and Victoria. So data-driven evidence-based research is deeply embedded in all aspects of the Regent Honey Eater Breed for Release program. We work within an adaptive management framework, and this is crucial as it enables us to adapt and change management actions based on what we learn with the species. Our overall objective for the program is to develop conservation actions to help the wild population to become self-sustaining. In 2021, we conducted our first evaluation of the zoo breeding program. And here we examined the zoo birds that were released to Victoria from 2008 to 2017, which was close to 300 birds. The purpose of the review was to examine the zoo practices and fitness parameters of the birds that promoted better post-release breeding success and survival times. And here we developed a set of breed and release guidelines for the program and we identified five key actions to achieve these objectives. I'll let Cara, one of our senior keepers at our Western Plains Zoo in Dubbo, explain how we implement these strategies. Currently standing in our flight aviary, which is planted out with native trees, shrubs and grasses. It measures 15 metres by 25 metres, and it's a place for them to learn before release. Zoe, is it possible to turn up the volume just a bit? that the region honeyers will need to yeah, I'll try. whether for competition for food or for space. And it's also a space where they can learn and build up their flight muscles. Sorry. These are crucial things, crucial tools that we need for them to learn before releasing them into the wild. We make sure that every bird spends at least eight weeks in this aviary before being considered for release. Does that help? Another way we are helping this species is by setting up yes. specialized Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Yeah tutoring and learning. We set up playback speakers that play the wild song and we also have male tutors who have learnt from previous years the wild song to teach our next generation. So all the juveniles from the year will go into this aviary with the playback speakers and the wild males to learn that song. We know that they need face-to-face -face learning to be able to do this. Again very important tool to have when releasing birds back into the wild. And the third and probably the most important is how we set up our breeding aviaries and our breeding pairs. There's a team of dedicated people who s go through the genetics and select the different pairs that we will breed that season. Each pair will get their own aviary. This is due to a few different factors, which I won't not go into today. But by limiting some of the clutches that they produce, we may be able to provide as much success for them as we possibly can, as much advantage as we can for them releasing to the wild. When it comes to releasing these birds, we do make sure there is a mixture between juvenile with first year birds and experienced breeding birds. We want to make sure that we inject the wild with pre birds who have previously bred so that they can be helpful to newer birds and juveniles in the wild and may be able to show them how it's done. Okay, so thank you, Cara, for that video. So as you can see, there are many moving parts to this program, as well as lots of highly skilled and dedicated people that work on this and other threatened species at the zoo. And so things have kept moving forward. And in 2020, the release site changed to New South Wales, and we started to generate some new information on the releases. And this year, we commenced our second review. And from that, we have developed these seven key actions shown here. The previous five that were already implemented were tracking well, so are kept. But as we continue to learn and adapt our practices, we have recommended some changes to improve and standardise our methods. So for example, um, we now recommend assigning a song tutoring score to individuals so that we can track any changes in their song over time and once released into the wild. The other two actions included uh, the addition of transmitters, where we are focusing our efforts on trialling newer designs and lighter weight options, 
As we see, the value from this information, if successful, would be a game changer in our attempts to help the species. The other action here is the consideration to parent age, where the evidence is showing where possible that we should be breeding from older mothers and younger fathers when matching pairs. So as mentioned um, before, we have undertaken a song tutoring program at the zoo, and this is because the zoo bred birds did not sound like wild birds. And so in the wild, birds would learn how to sing from social interactions with other regent honey eaters, and this wasn't happening in the zoo setting. So we set out to see if we could correct this by teaching young males how to sing. So we tried this by playing out wild region honey calls through speakers, and the songs were played out from dusk to dawn, and then we also had another um, group which received live tutoring and playbacks. And so we were fortunate enough to have wild birds that were brought in for the breeding program. And these males were placed adjacent to the young fledglings. And so the young birds could not only hear the calls being made, but could also see the behaviours that were being made in association with those calls. And then after the breeding season, those adult wild um, male adult um, adults were then placed in um, the aviary so that the young could interact directly with those individuals. And so I should also mention we had a PhD student running this program. And so as we ran this for a number of years, we could tweak the things that we've learned, including the reduction of the number of students to the tutor ratio, as well as tweaking the playbacks. And once we did that, we had a major breakthrough. And for the first time, we were able to hear zoo bred birds singing the wild song, which was quite a treat. And we found the best method was the birds that heard the live tutoring and the playbacks. We were also quite surprised at the fast accumulation of knowledge of the wild song through the zoo bred birds. And now we have a situation where we've got students who are now the tutors and are now tutoring the next generation of birds. And so this breakthrough comes at a very opportune moment because we now know the wild birds are having a shift in their song where their calls are becoming more simpler in their form and we think this is because of the number of individuals is going down and there's a further breakdown in the way they're learning and cultural loss. So the next thing we've been able to focus is nest protection measures. And this is because the birds are being heavily predated upon um, by uh, avian and mammalian predators. Current nest success is at about one fledgling per nest. And typically regent honey eaters will produce about two to three eggs per nest, and we really need to increase that to about 1.5 to 2 fledgings per nest to arrest decline. Now, we really also want to look at non-lethal measures to help deter the predators away from the nest, as a lot of these animals are native and some are also threatened. So we are now looking at options such as using ultrasonic deterrence to see if we can deter these small sugar gliders away from the nest. And we've just wrapping up a study with an honor student with a number of different zoos where we've looked at the impact of playing out these um, ultrasonic deterrents and it's proving to be successful at deterring those young um, small gliders. So we're now going to roll that technology out into the field to see if we can have some success there. So we've been able to do all of this research and found that one of the most challenging aspects of doing this work is to pull data in from different organizations and sources and so basically our current technologies haven't been able to keep pace with how we operate and they're no longer fit for purpose for our recovery program needs. Essentially what we wanted to do was to be able to track individuals from their time of birth at the zoo right to when they're released into the wild. So to do this effectively we've created um, a platform that brings all of this information together. And I should also mention that Sandy and her team at Species 360 have been very helpful and met with our team on a number of occasions to help us with this project. Um, this platform um, allows us the opportunity to investigate important conservation questions with ease and efficiencies. And there's also exciting possibilities with this platform, such as the development of specialist tools, such as the release candidate optimizer tool that will be able to ingest all of the evidence-based research and help to automate the selection of the ideal release candidate um, for the program. Okay, so we've made some very positive steps towards helping Regent honey eaters, but acknowledge, acknowledge there's a lot more work to be done in this space. And time really is of the essence for this species if we're going to help it thrive in the wild. And with respect to the science, our most important conservation actions we can do now for the species is to help recruit more juveniles to the population and continue to inject more high quality birds into the wild from the breeding program. 
So it certainly takes an army to breed and release and protect these precious Regent honey eaters. So I'm deeply grateful to everyone who has helped with this program. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. That was an no amazing presentation. It's really amazing to see everything that goes into these conservation breeding programs. Morgan, do we have questions for Dr. Tripovich? Hi, yes, we have. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so one of the first questions we have is, do you uh, archive genetic samples from the released bird so that there is a record of the genes released into the wild? Yes, so, and I didn't get a chance to discuss it. We are definitely looking at the genetics. Um, so that is something that, that we will be doing. And we can add that to the data platform as well. So it becomes a biobanking platform. Thank you. Uh, second question, but I think that you, you answered a bit quickly after the question was asked, is uh, what ZIMS data were used in this program? Is, was it just for the student books? Um, it was a lot of a lot of information actually. So the husbandry information, the PMX information, there's there's the um yeah, so a lot of there's lots of different components that go into this. Um and and I should also mention that data platform was a case study that we use the region Huddy Eater for. We see um that the value of that data platform being applicable to other threatened species and also encourage other people to get in contact if they're interested in understanding more about that data platform and how that can be used with their species as well. Thank you. Uh, not, oh my, there's a lot of questions, so I will try to be quick. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. So a more biological question about the honey heater. What is the life cycle of a honey heater and how many times they lay eggs in a year? Um, so they'll usually breed um, from now till January. Um, and typically they will have one to two uh, clutches per year, depending on how they go with resources in the wild. So if the first one doesn't work, maybe they might have a second nesting. So that's how the breeding goes. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any evidence of song regional dialects in this species, which might affect how the tutor birds perform in the wild? So based on the songs they are learning and influence mm -hmm. where you source your tutor birds from? Um, yes, that's a good question. There is regional dialects, but this pop, um, this species is now getting so contracted that really there's only one real uh, breeding population that's left. So we are using what's called the Blue Mountains typical, but actually even in the wild now that we're finding that that call is changing. So we're constantly having to think about these conservation issues and how we deal with the change that's happening in the wild. So... Yeah, I think it is it is something on our radar and we're we're going to have to think about how we deal with that, especially as the wild call is changing currently in the wild because of the low numbers of the birds. Thank you. Another question about um, if you estimated the survival of released individuals compared to the wild individuals, as we could expect higher for the later, given their experience of life in the wild. So is the question the survival between wild versus the zoo bred birds that are released? So we yes. I guess the way we Yeah, so I guess with the way we look at that is a couple of different ways. I guess the the one that we look at is survival to 12 months, the recite information that we have, and they are slightly comparable. Um I think they're at about 12% recite after 12 months. So it's still quite low of the zoo released birds and wild banded birds so they're really hard to find in the wild hence our focus on transmitters they're just a bit too then we'd love to put satellite transmitters on them so we can actually get a better detection rate of these birds um, I think that's the problem as well the detection rate is quite low thank you um and the question is uh what are the challenges faced by the birds Release in the wild, and do they have are they poach? Uh, do you have any idea of what kind of if they have poach as a songbirds? And yeah, poachers? Just, what are the yeah poachers? Um, yeah. Okay, um, I guess typically the the impacts that are facing the regent honey eater is deforestation and habitat destruction primarily, 
and now their habitat fragmentation. They don't have many poachers that we know of, but there are their low numbers are now causing them problems in the wild, as well as nest predation. So that's why we're focusing on nest protection measures. So um, we need to the we need to try and help the birds once they're breeding in the wild to see if they can recruit some juveniles to help the population increase. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, back to our program and our next speaker, Dr. Devin Chen. Dr. Devin Chen is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Toronto Zoo using multidisciplinary approaches to help inform animal conservation both in situ and ex situ. Devin received her master's degree in anthropology from the University of Calgary, studying arboreal camera trapping and occupancy modeling of wild lemur species. She went on to earn her PhD in wildlife science from Mississippi State University, studying assistant reproductive technologies for at-risk salamanders. Devin's work today is focused on the threatened Eastern Massasagua rattlesnake and utilizing Zim's data to inform the Toronto Zoo's conservation breeding and reintroduction program. The title of her presentation is Longitudinal Analysis of Threatened Eastern Massasagua, Massasagua, I don't know how you do that, Devin, <laughs> rattlesnake body growth rates using Zim's to inform conservation programs. Dr. Chen, the floor is yours. Um, today, yes, I'll be talking about the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake um, and utilizing Zim's data to inform conservation programs uh, surrounding this species. So, let's see. Sorry, one second. Let's do it this way. Alrighty, so the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake is a pygmy rattlesnake. Um, and this is exemplified by the middle photo there. You can see the fang size comparison between the Massasauga and diamondback rattlesnake. And so, they're quite small and they're found throughout the Midwest to Eastern United States, as well as in Ontario. Um, they are threatened throughout their range due to factors such as habitat fragmentation, road mortality, and human persecution. And so on this map on the right, you can see in Ontario, this is their historical range and over time it has been contracting. Um, and so the Toronto Zoo, which you can see on the map there, we've initiated a um, program for conservation breeding as well as reintroduction for the Eastern Massasauga within Ant Ontario. And specifically, we're focused on the Carolinian subpopulation. So this is the southern part of the map here. Um, and so we are looking to repatriate this species back into the Ojibwe Prairie, which is circled there um, in the southwest portion of the map. And so when we look at the distribution of Massasaugas, um, you can see that um, they are found mostly uh, within North America and quite um, it lines up quite well with their native range, which is helpful for conservation programs such as reintroductions. And so the size of the circles there you see, um, they are correlated with the number of snakes held at a zoo or XC2 uh, institution. And so the largest circle there is the Toronto Zoo. Um, we hold the largest population at 62 individuals. And the Eastern Massasauga is part of the um, AZA Species Survival Plan. So there are associated conservation programs and these can benefit from uh, data informed uh, decision making through research using great tools and resources such as ZIMS that are available. So my research focused on three um, distinct areas. So I first wanted to use um, data from ZIMS to find individual growth rates as well as weights across various life stages. Um, second, determine if there's birth seasonality within zoos. And then third, compare these results to data from wild populations. And so for my methods, I used the animals database within ZIMS, and I looked at Eastern Massasaugas born between 2000 and 2020, and I collected ID, sex, current institution, date of birth, origin, and weights. Um, for their age, I split up um, individuals into four different growth windows for um, their data. The first of these is the 0 to 11 months, or the first year of life. Second, the 12 to 35 months or one to three years where they're juveniles. 
And then 36 to 71 months or three to six years old, this is typically when the species will enter sexual maturity. And then lastly, 72 months and older or six years and older um, where they're considered fully mature individuals. I had the criterion of needing at least um, five weights within a window to be able to calculate a slope or the growth rate in grams per month. And this left me with 61 females and 51 males for analysis. And for my statistics, I used generalized additive modeling for location, scale, and shape um, in the um, program R using the package GAMLESS. I tested the fixed effects of sex, whether the individual was wild versus zoo-born, and institution on growth rates in each growth window to see if there was an effect. Um, my alpha value was 0 0.05 for significance testing. So if we get into the results here, on the y-axis we see the growth rate, whereas the x-axis we have these four dif different growth windows. Um, and then you'll see there are the three different variables and um, the yellow check mark indicates that there was a significant impact in that growth window. Um, so if we go from left to right, you'll see from zero to 11 months, institution had a significant effect. This could be due to differences in husbandry practice. 12 to 35 months, we see the asterisk at the top. This indicates that there was significantly higher growth in this growth window compared to the other windows. And specifically, we see that sex and institution had a significant effect, which I'll go into a bit more on the next slide. From 36 to 71 months, institution once again had a significant effect. And once we reached 72 months on the far right there, um, you can see there was no effect of any of the variables. We did see that there was significantly lower growth in the other growth windows, which makes sense as they are fully mature. And you can see the mean there is sitting um, just a little over zero. So this second window here is quite interesting where we're seeing um, the most amount of growth. And we saw that sex had a significant effect and when we look into that, um, we see that females are actually growing significantly more than males during this period. And if you look on the right, we see that um, in the orange line, this is a growth rate of females in the wild versus the blue, that's males. And so you see this mirroring where um, from one to three years old, once again, the females are having these faster growth rates. And this is likely due to um, growing for reproduction and gearing up and garnering resources for egg production, which is very costly. So it's quite interesting. We see this similar uh, higher growth rate with females, both in the wild and the zoo. Um, however, if you notice on this graph on the right, the blue keeps extending. So we see that males in the wild, it appears, are reaching these bigger sizes. And so this led to my next area of research, which was looking at um, whether our males in zoos are reaching higher sizes as well. So if we look at this graph here, this just shows the uh, raw masses of all the individuals. So on the y-axis, we have mass x-axis we have 0 to 120 months and so 0 to 12 years old and so we have the same four growth windows here and if you look from 36 to 71 months where they're entering sexual maturity females were heavier than males during this period however after the 72 months once they're fully mature there was no difference between um, the male and female masses which is not what we hypothesized to see where we would think the um, males would be reaching uh, a larger size so I delved into this a bit more, the comparison to the wild. So I found two studies that um, you can see here in the table, Dreslick and Lee. These are multi-year studies looking at the mass of uh, males and females in the wild. And so um, the Dreslick 2005 study found that males on average are heavier than females, as you can see. And Lee had a similar finding where males on average are heavier than females. Um, Dreslick went on in 2017 to do a further study that found males do become the larger sex after age six, so we do see some sexual size dimorphism um, in wild snakes, and this is thought to be related to male-male um, combat, which is a behavior exhibited by the species you can see in the upper right photo there. So the males well fight each other, um, and uh, they gain, the winner gains um, more reproductive access uh, events. And so it's thought that that larger size is evolutionarily ad adaptive um, for reproduction. However, when we look at the zoo data here on the right of the table, you can see that our females on average tend to be slightly heavier than the males. Um, and when you look just at the overall masses of the zoo, individuals versus the wild, you can see our zoo individuals are overall larger. Um, especially the females. And so this could be due to a range of factors, uh, possibly longer lifespan in zoos because you have 
um, lack of those threats such as predation, there are consistent feedings in zoos, and also an another important fact is the hibernation. So in the wild, this species does hibernate for several months on end without food. That's very difficult to approximate um, ex situ, and so this could be another factor leading to um, explaining this difference in weights we're seeing. And so next, I use Zim's data to look at the reproductive seasonality of eastern massasaugas within zoos. So in the wild, they are quite seasonal, so they'll mate in late summer in the fall. The females actually have internal sperm storage, which is really cool, and after hibernation, um, she will ovulate, females ovulate, and fertilization occurs, and most births are occurring in the wild in July or August. If you look on the right here using Zim's, Zim's data, um, I looked at when litters are being born in zoos and you can see there's pretty clear seasonality there and the top two months for births is um, are July and August. I also looked at sexually mature female mass over the year to see how that's fluctuating and we do see a slight increase before birth and then after it drops off, um, which makes sense. So the larger females were, were hypothesizing perhaps there could be an effect downstream on the offspring. So I looked at the mass of offspring of Eastern Massasaugas, and within Zims we found that um, neonates born within five days on average weigh 10.9 grams, whereas in the wild they accrued data from uh, various studies we found on average it's 10.3 grams. So they're pretty similar, but there is a slightly higher weight um, for the zoo-born offspring, which is interesting. Um, and so, in conclusion, longitudinal data from understudied taxa and ZIMS can be leveraged to find useful insights. It's a very powerful tool to be able to make data-driven decisions. Um, in, term, in terms of the Eastern Massasauga, for physiology, we found that females on average go faster than males, which matches up with wild data. Additionally, we found that the adult Massasaugas appear to be um, heavier than their wild counterparts, especially females. For management, um, this gave us great insight, um, for example, that the one to three year period is critical for growth for this species, and these results can be used as a benchmark for head starting programs and conservation breeding programs, which is really exciting. Um, so these are my references, and just want to say thank you to everyone, and I am happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Okay. Do we have questions for Dr. Chen? I don't. And thank you for this presentation. It's really nice to see reptiles represented more. <laughs> the first question is, did your research suggest, oh, now we're coming more, that the climate of where the zoo is located will impact uh, the growth? Right. So um, I did not get to that level of detail, but I definitely think that is a great next step is looking at, at latitude if we're seeing differences, because in the wild you do see differences in um, your growth and your um uh, birth months, for example, can be affected by the latitude. So, yeah, I definitely think that's a great next step to look into. Mm -hmm. And then another one, do you see any impact on the lack of hibernation on the reproductive success? Because in reptile species, this has been shown to be the case. Yes, yeah, so I don't think a uh, specific study has been done, but anecdotally, it seems like species or individuals that are given sort of a mock hibernation where their temperatures are dropped um, during those months that they typically typically be hibernating. Um, there seems to be a more reproductive success. And at the Toronto Zoo, um, there's a study that's being done looking at if we give the males the opportunity to exhibit the male-male combat and then breed, um, if, is, if there is an effect on the reproduction. And so that research is actively underway as well. So, yeah. Mm, thank you. And we have a related question to that. Do you see any trends on the birth seasonality depending on the institution? Uh, for example, is it possible that the housing condition like light temperature may impact the reproductive success or does the seasonality persist outside of these metrics? Right. So, yeah, I, I didn't get that deep into it, um, looking at yeah institutions for the birthing. So um, I definitely think that, yeah, once again, is a next step is looking at doing yeah, statistical modeling, seeing if these different institutions, the different way they're handling their species, if that has an effect on their reproduction. So definitely yeah, an opportunity for that and possibility. Yeah, so for now you can't expand what you mean with uh, differences in husbandry practices, just that you see the difference. Yes, yeah. correct. And then we have a question, if you can show your slide number four again. 
Uh, the one with your goals. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then we have, I am curious to know whenever you think the enclosure size could play a role in the difference in the growth rate between captive and wild individuals. And what are your thoughts on the movement for zoos to provide enclosure at least uh, corresponding to the length of the snake? Yeah, so yeah, that's another yeah great factor. And so there, yeah, it's very understudied, I would say. And I definitely think, um, yeah, looking at enclosure size, size, seeing how much these snakes are, you know, able to move, if that has an effect on, yeah, their, their energetics and their growth rates. So um, yeah, I think definitely having larger spaces in general is better um, for individuals. But yeah, I don't, I haven't looked at that data specifically, but yeah, there definitely could be an effect there. Um, as you have asked that females hibernate sperms in the winter and fertilization occurs in summer, can you please explain this in more details? Uh, yeah, so there's not a ton of research on it. Um, I found one published paper about it, but um, yeah, a lot of um, herpetofauna, they um, are very seasonal, so it's based on um, the seasons when they're ready to reproduce, but uh, many species um, and snakes, I know salamanders as well, um, they have internal sperm storage, so they'll mate earlier on when conditions are favorable, and then over the winter or another period of time, they're able to store um, within the female reproductive tract. There's specialized areas that can basically keep these uh, sperm um, in storage and in stasis until the eggs are ready and pass through, and then uh, fertilization can occur later on when yeah, it's favorable for the animal and offspring, so yeah. Thank you. That was a good experience. I think that's the question we have. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Terrific. Thank you, Devin. So next up, we have Borbala coxis, and this is a slightly different presentation. So far, we've, hear, we've heard from researchers that are using ZIMS in applied science. But now we'd like to offer how ZIMS data is being used in basic or fundamental research. And for that, I'd like to introduce Bobala Coxis. Bobala obtained her master's degree in environmental biology at the Utrecht University in the Netherlands, where she followed a behavioral ecology track and developed a keen interest in ex situ conservation and zoo conservation biology. Since 2017, she has worked at the Budapest Zoo and Botanical Garden in Hungary, currently as a research fellow. She started her PhD in 2021, where she studies the role of sex ratio, ecology, and demography in the evolution of vertebrates breeding systems. She is working on a comparative project using data from wild animals and data from captive animals via the ZIMS database. The title of her presentation is Adult Sex Ratio in Captive Amniotes. Is it related to sex determination systems? Well, we'll find out. Borbala, the floor is yours. So uh, um, thank you for being here and it's very nice to be here. Um, so the title of my presentation is uh, Adult Sex Ratios in Captive Amniotes. Is it related to the sex determination systems? And it sounds very complicated, uh, but it's not that bad. So uh, first, um, we can talk about uh, the terms, like what are amniotes? Uh, based on the classical, um, um, so they are reptiles, birds, and mammals. Uh, and sex determination systems, um, they are uh, determined how an organism develops male or female traits. And this can be genetic, um, alias uh, plays a, play a role uh, of the sex of the offspring, or it can be environmental. It's not genes, but the environment shapes the sex of the offspring. And uh, sex ratios, um, well, what is adult sex ratio? Um, first, a sex ratio is a proportion of males and females in the population. And uh, there are a lot of types, but I just want to highlight birth sex ratio, which is a sex ratio at birth or hatch, and adult sex ratio, which is the sex ratio at the sexual maturity. And the two things are not uh, always the same. 
Um, so adult sex ratio is uh, one of the most basic demographic characteristics of uh, populations. Um, it means basically how many adult males and females we have uh, in the population. And in uh, scientific terms, uh, we use the proportion of males in the adult population. Uh, this is a value which can uh, be from zero to one. And if it's uh, lower than 0.5, it means that in that population we have more females. And if it's uh, higher than 0.5, it means that we have more males in the population. Uh, this is not always around 0.5, it uh, varies widely in nature. Uh, it means that one sex is more common uh, than the other, and it, uh, it affects behavior and breeding uh, strategies of males and females. For example, if uh, we have more male, uh, they have to compete uh, more uh, for the lesser amount of females. And this other sex ratio, if it's not the same as the birth sex ratio, how does it emerge? Um, you know that infant mortality, predation, or selection pressures and environmental factors can play a role. Um, but we also know that it's not that simple. So probably it's multiple factors um, playing a role in it. And the genetic sex determination also affects it uh, from the vibe that, that is uh, proven. And the study from 2050 showed that in male heterogametic species, which are the XY uh, chromosome system species, the mammals, for example, uh, we have more females, while uh, in female heterogametic species, the ZW species, for example, all the birds, um, there are more adult males from generally all birds. And here is the layout of uh, what we do. Um, here you can see a birth sex ratio 0.5. It's a hypothetical thingy. Um, we have male monkeys and four female monkeys. Uh, in nature, uh, to have the wide of the sex ratio, uh, we know that uh, some factors, for example, the sex determination systems play a role. Um, they will uh, go through the sex specific adult mortality in the wild, which means that females and males are not dying at the same uh, rate or numbers. In this case, for example, four, um, from the four animals, three male monkeys died and one female. This will result in adult sex ratio of uh, 0.25. Um, we can see this in captivity too. And this is very uh, exciting because we know that zoos are artificial environments, not like in the nature. Uh, animals here, they don't need to copy for food or for the other sex. The predator free environment and they have veterinary access. Mm. These are just the most important things. So we can have two scenarios here uh, to see how the captive adult sex ratio emerges. We can look at environmental independent factors, for example, the sex determination system, we don't know that. And if uh, they play a role, uh, we can have the same sex specific specific adult mortality. So three male monkeys die, one female monkey dies. And this will result in the same adult sex ratio as in the wide. But if environmental factors play a role, uh, this can result in another sex specific adult mortality. For example, more females uh, die and less males. And this will result in another uh, uh, sex ratio than in the wide. And at this stage uh, in my studies, I'm investigating this question. Uh, to compare, uh, to see that whether the sex determination systems uh, play any roles uh, shaping the adult sex ratio uh, in captivity. So the question is, is the adult sex ratio related to the sex determination systems in captive amniotes? So how we can investigate this? Um, species 360 is wonderful because um, we have demographic data of captive animals. And it's very nice because it's uh, standardized data from uh, all the zoos worldwide uh, from a very long uh, time. So we can have raw demo demographic data from captivity. Um, we received almost 3,000 uh, species uh, from species 360, which is a wonderful number, uh, I think. And uh, this was our uh, start. And from this, we could calculate the captive adult sex ratio. Uh, we did this for each species. Uh, basically, we divided the number of males uh, by the number of males and females. And for each species, we calculated this for each year. Um, this starts uh, from the 60s. Here you can see just a couple of years. So uh, each year we calculated a yearly adult sex ratio, and we took the average of these yearly adult sex ratios, and uh, we used this in our analysis. 
Um, but we know that uh, some zoos or most of the zoos uh, keep species in low numbers because uh, they are rare and we didn't want um, this to affect our data. So we set a minimum criteria. Um, we basically took the average yearly number of individuals, which is all the number of individuals divided by the number of years with data available. And every uh, species below 10 was discarded from our data set. Um, after this, uh, we still had almost 1,200 species, which is still a very, very nice number. And so we just needed to collect the sex determination information on those species. Uh, what we did, uh, we had three categories. Uh, we collected male heterogametic uh, species, female heterogametic, and they are the genetic sex determination category. Uh, they are the mammals, birds, and some reptiles. And we also collected temperature-dependent sex determination system. Uh, some reptiles are like this. This means that uh, the sex of the offspring depends on the temperature. So if it's more uh, warm, it can be a male. If it's lower, it's a male. And the source, we use the three of sex database. Uh, we collected data from the literature. And we also made assumptions. Uh, for example, all mammals uh, are male heterogametic, and we uh, assume that all birds are female heterogametic. Uh, so our final data set was a very high number of species. And to test whether the sex determination system has any effect on the captive adult sex ratio, we ran uh, GLS models with a phylogenetic control. Um, and here are our results, but I think it's better if you see a uh, graph. Um, here, um, we found significant differences. First, between female heterogametic species, you can see the purple color, and male heterogametic species, the blue one. And uh, on the y-axis, you can see that if the captive adult sex ratio is closer to one, it means that in that population, there are more males. If it's lower uh, and closer to zero, it means that there are more females. So the female heterogenetic species, we had more uh, males, and the male heterogenetic uh, species, we had more females in the populations. And we also found a significant difference between female heterogenetic species, again, the purple column, and the TSD, the temperature-dependent uh, sex determination species. And it was the, uh, the same, like temperature-dependent species, they had uh, more females in the population. And it, it uh, to answer this question, that is the adult sex ratio related to the sex determination systems in captive amniote, based on our results, we can say uh, yes. And our conclusions that we found similar relationship between the sex determination systems and adult sex ratio is in the nature, so the pattern is the same. Like male heterogametic species have more females in the population, female heterogametic species have more males in their population. And so it seems that the uh, sex determination uh, systems play an important role in uh, shaping this adult sex ratio, both in captivity and also in the wild. Uh, so there could be a genetic basis of the development of the adult sex ratio, and uh, or that no other factors mask uh, its effect uh, on animals uh, under human care. And I want to thank you for your attention. And here are my uh, authors and uh, supervisors. And uh, thank you for all the hard work everyone put in the record keeping because it's an immense work. And we also appreciate uh, the species and the city board's approval to use the data for scientific publication. So if you have any questions, just uh, ask them in the chat or not the chat, the uh, question box. Thank you, Babala. That was an excellent presentation highlighting the use of, of ZIMS data in basic research. Morgan, do we have any questions? Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we have some questions. So uh, one of them is uh, how do you how did you took into account to estimate the adult sex ratio? Uh, the animals that have been removed from uh, from the data set for curling uh, management reasons, for example, that it's not by uh, it's not naturally, but for management reason that they are they didn't reach uh, adulthood. Uh, we never received uh, those data, so we received uh, a full uh, data set uh, cleared uh, from uh, those. So we had just uh, the adult uh, uh, data from the adult animals. Or if that was the question. <laughs> 
yeah so it's more how do you how do you think it can uh bias or change the the results if you had yeah. information yeah it, it's possible uh, we were thinking about that also uh, we were thinking about animals living as uh, institutions um but uh, it's very difficult to to track first and second we have such a big uh, data set that uh, that it, it might uh, uh, not have an effect so we have almost 1200 species thank you um another one who's for the data from zoos did you exclude reptiles known to have temperature dependent sex determination and those that are known to have some type of pathogenesis? Uh, we excluded the uh, pathogenesis as the, um, in our first analysis, uh, but the temperature dependence sex ratio, we, we didn't. So, for example, we, we don't know from all the zoos because we don't have individual institution data that we do uh, set the breeder, for example, to a higher temperature to have uh, one uh, specific sex. Uh, we, we didn't uh, do that, so we don't know. Thank you. There is one who is a bit uh, completely related, who was uh, where any of the reptile species known to have facultative pathogenesis and would that impact the analysis? But... Yes, we do. <laughs> um, another one is, do you know if uh, your sex ratio results are stable over time? I asked because in the early decades, zoos often made arbitrary choices on which birds, reptiles and amphibians to enter into ARCs, ZIMs, databases, because you paid for each record. Yeah, uh, we were thinking about that and we we tried to to include like a year bias. It, it's quite complicated to explain, but uh, we, we were thinking about how to, to see, for example, if, if zoos kept uh, a bird species, for example, just males, because uh, those were uh, more colorful. And um, we ran some uh, preliminary analysis and we didn't see an effect on that. But we will uh, have a deeper look into that because we might think it can have an effect. Thank you. And one last question for now. Um, so to perform this analytics, you did you assume uh, that the birth sex ratio was of 0 0.5 for every species? And uh, what happened if it's not the case? No, no, we, we calculated the other sex ratios. So those were all uh, calculated from the... Or... No, the birth. The birth sex ratio. Did you assume that it was 0 0.5 for every species? Oh, no, no, no. That was just an example to, to uh, present what is the idea behind. It was totally theoretical in the made-up example. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we arrive at the end of the of the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Borbala. Excellent presentation. So next, our next speaker is Dr. Drew Sauvé. Dr. Sauvé is an evolutionary ecologist interested in human managed and human effective wild po wildlife populations. Drew is a Mathematics of Information, Technology, and Complex Systems, or MITAX, Elevate Postdoctoral Fellow, working with the University of Quebec in Montreal and the African Lion Safari to study evolution and trait change in conservation breeding programs. The title of his presentation is Contemporary Genetic Adaptation in Zoos and Conservation Breeding Programs. Dr. Sauvé, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Sandy, for that nice introduction. And thank you to the Species 360 team for this wonderful symposium. Um, I've been very excited to see the different scientists talks and I'm excited to talk to you a little bit today about genetic adaptation in zoos. So just a little bit background on me is that I started in kind of wildlife biology, wildlife ecology, and a major question that I was always interested in is how fast is adaptive genetic change? And when I was thinking about this question, I was thinking about uh, seabirds, uh, Canadian seabirds, and trying to answer the question as to whether or not we can predict population persistence in the face of changing environmental conditions. 
And so I'm still thinking about this question about how fast adaptive genetic change might be. But now I'm thinking about it in the context of zoos and conservation breeding programs. Mainly, is it occurring in our zoos and conservation breeding programs? Is it going to affect our ability to use these programs to augment wild populations? And I come at this from kind of a particular background in quantitative genetics, where I'm very interested in this very particular parameter, which is called the additive genetic variation in fitness. And what this value tells us is the change in average fitness per generation, or it's a measure of the rate of the adaptive genetic change in a population. One way to kind of think about this, I've illustrated with these uh, little acorns here, is if you imagine that each black acorn is an individual, an adult acorn, and each gray, corn, gray acorn is their offspring, uh, the entire offspring they produce over their life. You can imagine in this scenario that I presented to the left, we have no variation in the number of children these acorns are producing over their lifespan. So we have no evolution by natural selection or by selection. Versus a situation where we had three black acorns again, and this time each acorn is producing a different number of offspring. So in this case, we have variation in the number of offspring produced uh, in our population, and we're going to get uh, potentially evolution by natural selection. So that's one way to think about this particular parameter. There are some downsides to the additive genetic variance of fitness. We're going to need a lot of data where we need relatedness among individuals. We need to have measures of fitness. Uh, whenever I'm using that word in this presentation, I'm talking about lifetime breeding success or the total number of children or offspring that individual has produced over its lifetime. And we also need to try to measure some confounding factors, uh, such as common environments, gene flow, maternal environments um, that might be shared among relatives. And where I'm interested in applying this again is the zoos and conservation breeding programs. We have this shift in the roles of zoos shifting to increase in conservation activity. Um, we have uh, kind of international and government mandates that are suggesting ex situ be used in some of these programs. So I wanted to ask, well, if we're, we're going to be increasing our use of this, um, is adaptive genetic change going to be kind of a problem in our ability to augment wild populations? We know from kind of a variety of studies, one I'm just highlighting here, is that we have evidence of trait change for certain traits in breeding program programs. So in Hubera bustards, we have this mean number of eggs laid that has changed across generations. We also know that when we try to release individuals into the wild, they tend to perform poorly compared to their wild counterparts. So this is just a recent meta-analysis and biological reviews, where on the y-axis we have different taxonomic groups. We have this lawn odds ratio on the x-axis. The important thing to take away from this particular graph is that every time this distribution is kind of to the left of that particular graph, we have our released individuals performing, uh, having lower fitness than their wild counterparts. So they might not survive as long. They might not produce as many offspring. So this kind of leads me to the main question, which is could adaptive genetic change in conservation programs be infecting reintroduction success? To get at this question, we need to first answer this question of whether adaptive genetic change is occurring in our conservation programs at all. So again, we're gonna need lots of data, relatedness among individuals, accurate measures of fitness for the total number of offspring individuals are producing. And thankfully, zoo data is really well suited for this. Um, I just, you know, again, want to highlight this Species 360 database where we have these 10 million individual animal records. I think I can speak for a lot of scientists on this panel that it's just an incredibly exciting amount of data to be able to work with. Um, and thankfully, there's things like pedigrees that are, are kept track of that we can use for relatedness. For the particular data set that we used in this study, we were looking at some of these longer term pedigrees with lots of data. So we ended up with 31 species in the end. We had about 2,500 years of data. Some of the longest maintained records that we looked at go back to 1877. Um, and we have just over 250,000 individual animals in this particular analysis. Um, I won't talk too much about the methods, but I just want to highlight that in recent years, a lot of scientists have done a lot of hard work 
on getting the statistics right for modeling something like lifetime breeding success. Um, so we kind of copied these methods and applied it to the zoo setting. Um, a lot of the inspiration from this work came from a recent results from wild populations where people very painstakingly have kept these really long-term wild data sets. Um, and they went out and they measured this rate of adaptive genetic change in these populations. On the y-axis on this graph to your right, we have our different species. On the x, we have this measure, additive genetic variance of fitness, or the rate of adaptive genetic change. And each of these distribution is just showing kind of our confidence or our estimate of that. So the broader the distribution, a little less confidence we have in where that estimate lies, but anything kind of shifted to the right here, we have some evidence for um, adaptive genetic change. And kind of the one of the main highlights from this wild study was that rates of adaptive genetic change were a lot faster than had kind of previously been estimated. And so when we pull our estimates from these zoo populations and try and replicate this in the zoo setting and conservation breeding program setting. One of the things that I found quite surprising when we pulled this out is that we actually have a very similar estimate of the rate of adaptive genetic change compared to these wild populations. So we ended up getting the 0.17 compared to this 0.185. This was surprising to me, um, maybe not surprising to, to other folks that we have this kind of rate of change, but I was expecting a little lower rate. Um, what that looks like for each of the species. I have them ranked from kind of the slowest rates of adaptive genetic change to the fastest rates. And then the coloration on these kind of moving from blue to the darker purple is kind of our confidence that that estimate uh, doesn't overlap or come close to zero. So we have more confidence that we are observing rates of adaptive genetic change in these darker purple graphs. The one thing I want to highlight here is that we have variation. So we have some populations that it seems like you know, quite slow rates of adaptive genetic change and some where we have faster rates of adaptive genetic change. Um, so I've kind of talked about these numbers a lot. I just wanted to kind of put some of them in context. So on the y-axis here, we have fitness. You can think of this as the, the um, average number of offspring or the average number of offspring that an individual in a population might produce. And if we start with some populations where the average individual produces one offspring in generation zero. We have these different lines where we've given different additive genetic variants of fitness values to these different populations. And you can see how the average number of offspring changes across generations. So the largest value in our study is 0 0.5, where we have uh, potentially these populations producing on average three offspring over their total lifespan instead of this one. Realistically, things are not going to be that high. We have a lot of environmental factors that also play a role. And our average estimate is this 0 0.175 down here. So why do we see this additive genetic variation in fitness? A lot of breeding plans uh, are kind of aimed at reducing variation in fitness. But I think there's going to be variation in the logistics of implementing these. Um, it's going to be hard to move some animals or breed some animals in a particular way. Um, we also know that the breeding environment is often quite different from wild populations. People are working on this to try and make it more similar to avoid these types of things. Um, I also think an important key part of this is that many of these populations have very complex management histories. Some have been managed solely with a reintroduction focus, while others have been managed by people kind of before the concept of evolutionary management. If you remember that 1877 study or the 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 oldest records, that's not too far off from Darwin's origin of species. So you can imagine they weren't thinking about evolutionary management necessarily when they started these programs. So my conclusions, we have some evidence that genetic adaptation is likely occurring in zoos and conservation breeding programs. We need to determine exactly why some population might show these signals and others might not. I think our results provide kind of a starting point for this. Kind of linked, it could be kind of a tool for management managers does their particular population that they're interested in show these signals of adaptive genetic change? And finally, I think it opens a lot of questions. You know, we don't really have an answer to like, if we have adaptive genetic change, what is the selective agent? What's acting on these traits? And what are the consequences of this adaptation um, for reintroduction? With that, I have my acknowledgements and funding to thank and everybody today for uh, taking time to listen. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Sauvé. That was very interesting. It's amazing to hear some of the considerations that zoos and aquariums need to really take into account when developing their breeding programs. Um, okay, so okay, do we have questions for Dr. We Sauvé? do indeed. And I completely agree with you, Sandy. This is really, really great. The first question is, how can you account for the fact that all of these captive populations are managed in breeding programs and by that the lifetime reproductive success is fairly artificial? And how does that change the question that you are trying to solve? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in some ways this measure of selection that we're having is more of a mix of in some ways, artificial selection, right? And that we're trying to manage these things and we, you know, might accidentally select for for certain behaviors or traits more so. I, I wouldn't claim to say it's a it's a measure of what these animals would be, you know, what their their natural lifetime breeding success would be. And it would be interesting to see how that compares. Like, does an individual that does well or is chosen in a zoo population, is that somebody who does well, in the wild, I don't think we necessarily know, but I could see reasons that it might not line up. Yeah, so it's really related to another question. How would you avoid the selection in zoos to keep animals adaptable to the environments of the wild in the case it will be able to reintroduce them? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really hard question. I, I think some of these breeding designs, like minimizing mean kinship, like really strictly adhering to them, in theory should avoid some of this but some of it's gonna in my mind come down to like the environment's just different like even the the individuals that you're able to get into the program i think is uh you're doing some selection right off the bat there too right um it's a tricky question but in my mind it's it comes down to kind of the environment and looking at maybe we can use these results to say okay well these species we seem to see this evidence and then we can further investigate like well, what, why do we see it in this species and not another? Um, and that, yeah. That makes sense. And it's, and we are kind of going into this direction again. With such long term data sets, how did you factor in changing husbandry factors, which might affect the breeding success in many species? And is it possible that the higher rate is partly due to the fact that zoos are better at keeping these species now than in the past. Yeah, so I mean we did try to control for some of that. Like we use some some uh in our models we use some year effects to try and control for the fact of like changing fitness. Mean fitness might just change in a population because of husbandry. Sometimes I think we see the um total offspring actually drop off. And sometimes I think that actually might be because they're trying to minimize mean kinship a little more. So in some cases, it's actually a, a good thing if the average fitness isn't as as high. Um, so that's how we tried to control for it. I'm sure there's components that are missing a little still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what is the average number of generations in the vertebrate species you have used? Perhaps a reliable estimate of additive genetic variation requires more than three to four generations. Yeah, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but it, it ranges quite a bit. And I, I think certainly most of them have more than three to four generations from the, the populations that we chose. Mm -hmm. Would yeah. the genetic diversity and inbreeding coefficient for population impact your results? For example, red wolves in captivity are from 13 animals from the wild, and otherwise they were extinct in the wild. Also, black ferrets were also all brought into captivity and breeding programs where these programs were developed from a very few initial individuals. Yes. Um, so we did include inbreeding coefficients to try and, because that, that can affect your, your measure, your estimate of the additive genetic variance of fitness. Um, however, the pedigree and breeding coefficient is not perfect. It relies on some assumptions about the relatedness of the founders, right? So it, it's not a perfect control for that. Um, but barring getting kind of, you know, sequencing done on many samples that I'm sure don't exist, we can't quite capture that yet. But we tried our best at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you are really fast, are you particularly concerned about a specific species? 
No, I, I don't know if I, maybe with <laughs> consulting some zookeepers and stuff, like sometimes that's the interesting that comes out, right? Is that um, some of the species we worked on, they've been like, oh, this trait is definitely changing. And I think that's a great starting point is when people notice those sorts of things that we can start to get the data to try and ask, well, is that evolution that we're accidentally causing? Yeah. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Sauvé. Thank you, Reke. Thank you. Okay, for our final presentation today, I would like to introduce Dr. Thomas Ziegler. Dr. Ziegler is curator of Cologne Zoo's Aquarium Tropical House, coordinator of the zoo's biodiversity research and conservation projects in Vietnam, and adjunct professor at the University of Cologne. Thomas and his team celebrate the idea of the conservation zoo, zoos as modern day arcs that donate their facilities, expertise, time and money to endangered species, for which he also received an international award from the Blue Loop Zoo and Aquarium Influencer List in 2022. More than 100 endangered species are kept at the Colon Zoo's aquarium and conservation breeding projects are linked to local projects so that ex situ and in situ conservation measures can complement <clears throat> and support each other. Because as Thomas says, the ark literally has to return to land later. The title of his presentation is how Species 360 substantially contributes to the buildup of the conservation zoo, zoos as one plan approach conservation centers acting as modern arcs. Dr. Ziegler, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This presentation is about, as you said, how Species 360 substantially contributes to the buildup of the conservation zoo. And this presentation is together with terrarium section keeper Anna Rauhaus, which enters the ZIM starter here, and with whom I have developed the research scenarios I will introduce you in the following. As already mentioned, this is the Cologne Zoo's aquarium in Germany and Europe, and we have a focus on threatened species. More than 100 are listed on the ICN red list, and for most of them, we run one plan approach to conservation conservation projects with the countries of origin. And the one plan approach, which has been mentioned already several times, is a very important initiative uh, created by the Conservation Planning Specialist Group of the ICN, which brings together all experts available, all responsible parties, whether inside or outside the natural range. That means a wonderful combination of in situ and ex situ um, conservation activities, which gives the zoos a unique chance to bring in their ex situ um, expertise and act as modern conservation uh, centers. Um, yeah, and the uh, one plan approach is very important because it helps to buy time. And this is a very sad story. On the left side, this is a picture made last year in June. This is, as it seems, the last female of the uh, Yangtze giant softshell turtle found dead in Vietnam and there are now only two two old males remaining so it seems this species will get extinct quite soon here we lost um, the chance we were not quick enough and this is um, what the one plan approach says um, by time we did it with the species on the right this is also a soft shell turtle this is the spotted soft shell turtle our team described only a few years uh, from Vietnam and we directly uh, reacted, we built a conservation center, we could breed the species and already release individuals of this threatened taxon to the wild. So we have a chance, but we must act in time and concerted and targeted action. Another nice example is the um, Philippine crocodile repatriation, which is listed as a success story on the reverse the red homepage. And we have um, in the stud book, in the European stud book, a genetically pure population. We do the natural breeding and already have sent several times uh, bred individuals from Europe back to the Philippines to restock the diminished natural populations, which shows which powerful zoos can act in terms of the one plan approach and, of course, the reverse the red. And if the zoo wants to act as a conservation zoo, as a modern arc, then we should provide our facilities, expertise, funds, and time for threatened AXA. And here is exactly when ZIMS and Species 360 comes into the play. 
We started with this in 2016 here on the upper left with monitor lizards. These are taxon oriented studies. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, more than 20 such papers have been published by our team. Monitor lizards, crocodiles, amphibians, turtles, geckos, and also passerine birds. A recent study funded by VDZ. And uh, here we went for taxa. And the other option is we go for um, regions, regional oriented one plan approach analysis on the upper left, recently published in Nature Conservation Assessment of the Spread Status of the Amphibians of Vietnam and on the lower right, the um, herbs of Madagascar and just published a few days ago, the mammals of Madagascar. Okay, what do we do with the ZIMS data? First, we need taxon lists or country or regional lists. And then we check how many of these species are already uh, in ZIMS. Um, how is the stock, the population number, how many individuals, how is the sex ratio, how many institutions and institutions in which region to keep the species. Then we add data from the ice and red list, the threat status, the population status. And finally, we check how many um, um, institutions have bred the species within the past 12 months. And then this study on the right side um, on pasturing birds recently published in JASA, Journal of Zoo and Aquarium Research. We see that um, the birds kept uh, globally, only a few number are threatened and the most green are not threatened. And we can also see that here in Asia, the most threatened taxa are kept. So this already leads us to find the gaps in ex situ conservation and helps us to fill these gaps. In turtles, we are a bit further. So you see there are more threatened taxa kept in zoos than non-threatened, but this is how we can change the situation if we bring the attention of the colleagues to that. Um, in this paper published this year in Global Ecology and Conservation on skinks, you see the breeding successes. The black one are the bred uh, ones and here the not threatened and the threatened ones. You see the ratio of the um, breeding successes to those who not bred. And you see there is also much space um, to the top. And you see the threatened taxa were only bred in one zoo, which is of course not optimal. Yeah, and only a few zoos, um, um, yeah, uh, only a few species were bred by several zoos, which is quite important in terms of conservation breeding networks to be built up. We have a focus on uh, threatened Madagascar freshwater fish species. You see here all the ICN red list buttons. We keep 10 threatened species. And Laura Lies, master student in the group, wrote her thesis about a ZIMS analysis about threatened Malagasy freshwater fish species published recently in Zoo Biology. And you see these are the fish species held globally. And you see the most commonly held species is a not threatened species clearly held in too high numbers. And this, of course, a species held in too low numbers. This gives us an overview where we can improve the situation. And we also found out how many threatened species are not yet held in zoos and do not benefit from a, um, an ex to conservation by zoos. It also gives a regional overview, for example, here in Europe, in Germany, we keep 12 species of Madagazi freshwater fish species 11 of them threaten nearly 800. And in Portugal, it's only one species held in four individuals at the time of writing of this study. And yeah, at the end of this paper, we gave recommendations. Um, yeah, increased number of holdings for this species only held in Toronto Zoo. If something happens there, then it, yeah, it's done with this assurance granny. So we need more participants. And the green ones are species which are threatened, but only kept in private hands. This is, of course, no ZIMS data. This is data from service with private persons, but this helps us to fill the gaps in conservation. Laura, the student, um, was happy. She wanted to make a difference. She could make a difference. Um, the, the newspaper reported about this case. Um, we can be an ARC. Cologne Zoo supervises research projects of committed students. Goal is always the protection of threatened species. And recently we got the notification by Zoo Biology. Congratulations, your work is one of our most cited papers. So it's cool. Many colleagues are interested in these studies pointing to the gaps in conservation so they can orientate how they can improve their 
collections. We publish that also in science. Yeah, for how many um, Malagasy um, vertebrate species already ex situ um, conservation breeding projects exist and um, where gaps have to be filled. And currently it's the Vietnamese conservation campaign by the YASA European Association of Zoos and Aquaria. And here we already studied the amphibians and Dennis Rutter, the colleague from the Museum Clinic in Bonn, does these richness analysis based on the SIMS data. And you see most of Vietnamese threatened amphibians are held in Europe and North America, but none in the country itself. So these data also are helpful to give orientation to the range countries to improve the situation within their countries. Yeah, and on top, we can also do these studies like here. There's a microendemism center in Vietnam in the central highlands. They live 26 microendemic amphibian species only occurring in there. And so with this information, we can also help the partners in Vietnam to go for building up of ex situ um, projects in breeding stations, in zoos, as we just did a few weeks ago within the Vietnamese campaign for this threatened mossy frog species endangered. It has not a protection by a protected area, which we now could bring to into a conservation breeding program. And um, the same we did for the reptiles. Here you see the center's highest diversity of threatened taxa, the national parks, and that also the media is interested is, uh, in this, like here in the Monga Bay for Vietnam's rare reptiles, lack of captive populations may spell doom, which brings the work of zoos into another light, into a light of conservation. And summarizing, how can we further develop? We must act sustainable. We need networks, investigate cryptic diversity, cooperations, and reverse confiscations. And this is to show that zoos really can be, thanks to species 360 and ZIMS, to 100% conservation. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ziegler. That was a wonderful presentation, really highlighting the value and the potential of zoological institutions in contributing to species conservation. So, Morgan, do we have some questions for Thomas? Yes, we have a few. And once again, that's uh, really nice to see a bit of reptiles in presentations. <laughs> um, so one of the questions is, um, do you know how much the, the data might be distorted by many zoos still not being members of Species 360, especially in Asia or Africa? Meaning that this will be missing from these data sets, but what might be the impact of that? Absolutely. And this is always in the material method section of our papers. This is no complete data. This is only ZIMS data. Um, we try to complement these data sets with other databases and then only can fill one or two or three, uh, only a few more species. But it gives a general overview. Yeah. And this helps us. Of course, this is not 100% the, the final situation. As you said, some zoos are not joining ZIMS. Some zoos do not type in their data, but it's a, a, a relatively good overview. And with these people, with these papers, we also try to reach those zoos maybe who have a important species or group in their, in their uh, holdings, which then can contact us. And so we can complete uh, the next round of research. Thank you very much for this answer. Another one is, uh, you say that it's important to focus on threatened species. Do you think there is still a place for non-threatened species for commercial values in zoological institutions? Or do you think guests will still come through the gates for species that are less charismatic? Um, yeah, I must honestly say, maybe you have heard that from my and our presentation, my team and I, we go for conservation clearly. And we think also maybe not so colorful species are very charismatic if you do the storytelling. Yeah. So always we do a guided tour to our uh, Vietnamese crocodile newts, which are black and small. But if you tell the story, um, people find that quite cool. So we will always go for the threatened species if we have the uh, uh, option to select. 
And yeah, for us, it's it's um, important to act as a modern arc because I also work in Vietnam myself since nearly 30 years and I see how uh, uh, bad is the development um, um, with nature. So it's really important to do something. And if we have the chance to replace a not threatened species by threatened species, we should use that chance before it's too late. Um, of course, um, um, there are many options. For example, here in Europe, we also have the citizen conservation programs, which involve the private uh, keeper and breeder. Yeah, So they can be part of a breeding network. And these are no institutions. These are private. So there are um, many ways um, to go into the, the same direction. Thank you. Another question is, um... What do you think that the zoological institution will look like in the future? Um, do you have the feeling that more and more reptiles, amphibians, and threatened species will be included by uh, choice in the collection or just because the extinction rate is increasing? Yeah, so there, 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 there is a change. Um, interestingly, it was uh, Corona crisis who uh, led us to these ZIMS analysis because the students could not go to the labs. And Anna and I, we have uh, thought about how can we change the situation? And then we thought, hey, with a link, it's easy to work from home for them. Yeah. So uh, Corona crisis really gave a big push into these uh, research scenarios. And I have mentioned the Vietnamesing campaign. And before, nearly no one uh, knew about uh, Vietnamese giant magnolia snail, but now we have already established at three places in Vietnam a conservation breeding. Um, and the conservation breeding is, is ex existing in Europe. Things can change quite quickly if we recognize them and then we go for them. Yeah, So it's just making on the way and, and changing something. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ziegler. That concludes our presentation for today. And I would really like to thank all of our speakers um, for wonderful presentations. I know I've learned a lot here today and I'm sure our audience did as well. I'm really inspired by the interesting and creative ways you're using Zim's data in research. And to summarize, we've really learned um, a lot of different ways of using Zim's data in research including how it in fact how it can aid zoological species collection planning we've heard a lot about the one plan approach and some considerations about um, genetically diverse species uh, and maximizing that in our reintroduction programs um, a lot about adaptive management strategies and saving threatened species from extinction so um, it's been a great event, and I would like to thank all of our speakers for supporting our very first Species 360 Conservation Science Alliance Research Symposium. I would also like to thank Species 360 team members, Josh, Hannah, Gabrielle, Reke, and Morgan for making this event possible, and for our international audience who joined us from all over the world. We really hope this selection of international research inspires you to consider using ZIMS data and to join Species 360. So if you are interested in sharing a project that utilizes ZIMS data, or you'd like to learn more about accessing ZIMS data through our research request process, or if you'd like to collaborate on a project uh, with a uh, on a project with us in the future, please scan these QR codes to do so. And if you are interested in joining Species 360, or if you have more questions about the CSA, simply reach out to me or our support team at this email address. In closing, we'd like to thank our Species 360 Conservation Science Alliance sponsors once again for making events like this possible. If you enjoyed this symposium, please consider becoming a CSA sponsor to enable us to continue to develop future symposiums and scientific resources for our community. The CSA exists to facilitate this type of international collaboration and data sharing so that we can inspire each other for additional research applications using ZIMS data. 
And of course, we'd like to thank all of our Species 360 members for contributing their data to ZIMS to facilitate international data sharing and data-informed decision-making. Thanks to our audience for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at next, year, next year's event. Thank you and take care.